In today's video, we have all kinds of NHL news and rumors to discuss. Uh, today, we're looking at the Toronto Maple Leafs. We have some updates on the trade request from forward Nick Robertson. Plus, we're also taking a look at the new Leon Dreisaitl contract extension. Is that going to have an impact on the future earnings and contract for Mitch Marner? And will John Tavares be sticking around in Toronto? Or what does his future hold after this season, especially considering he's no longer the Leafs captain? We have several updates regarding three players have announced their retirements today and several PTOs and some other RFA news as well, including updates on Cole Perfetti, Lucas Raymond, Mo Sider, and more. All that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have lots of news and rumors to take a look at here today. Uh, let's start with first with some retirement announcements. We've got three pro NHL players that are no longer going to be participating in professional hockey. And let's start with Mark Stahl, who's got over 1,000 games, actually over 1,100 games to his NHL resume. I uh, played mostly with the New York Rangers. Of course, played a bit with the uh, Red Wings, Panthers, and Flyers as well. Uh, Mark Stahl has announced his retirement from the game of NHL hockey and is going back with the Rangers to work as a development coach. Uh, so Mark Stahl certainly had a pretty solid run, uh, pretty solid career overall. I uh, certainly wish him the best in uh, his uh, next role with the New York Rangers. Uh, we've also seen a longtime NHL defenseman of 17 seasons, Alex Goligoski, has also announced his retirement. And 13 uh, year pro Brad Malone. Of course, uh, uh, I'm personally from New Brunswick. I share a home province of Brad Malone. The Malone family has deep roots in history uh, in this province. All kinds of Malone hockey players that have uh, come from here, and a lot of them have played here locally. And I'm, some have gone on, obviously, to play um, you know, at the higher levels for sure. But Brad Malone played a lot in the minors, but he was still a pro hockey player at, between the NHL and AHL uh, for 13 seasons. But I think the last seven years in the Oilers organization, a lot with Bakersfield, uh, obviously to some degree a little bit with the Edmonton Oilers at the NHL level as well. Um, he's played over 769 pro games in total, uh, and he's now going to be taking a role uh, in the OHL uh, as a development coach as well. So Brad Malone will continue to be involved in the game of hockey in a different level. Uh, so again, congrats to uh, to Brad Malone on a on a solid run. Not all players get to be long, long time big NHL stars, but the fact that you know some of these guys can carve out you know 10, 15 year careers, even if it does involve a fair bit of time, uh, you know the AHL is still pretty remarkable when you think about the percentage of players that actually get to that level and actually you know get to be up that level. I mean, to be bad in the NHL, you still have to be really, really good and way better than the average player uh, like me or you or most of the people watching this video. So certainly congrats to all three of those guys on uh, on a heck of a career and solid runs in their own right for sure. Uh, a few updates in Anaheim. They've signed goaltender Oscar Dance, the 31-year-old. It's a one-year contract uh, on a two-way deal, so he'll provide some extra depth from goaltending in the organization. And they also got bad news today on their top prospect and former number three overall pick from this year's 2024 NHL draft. Beckett Seneca is going to miss the first six to eight weeks of the season with a fractured foot. Obviously an unfortunate uh, training accident there. So uh, 68 weeks actually from now, not necessarily from the uh, beginning of the season. So with training camp set to open in about two weeks' time, uh, obviously for Beckett, he'll miss um, he'll miss camp, and then he'll miss the first little bit of the season as well. He probably won't really be playing games until uh, – you know, you're, you're, you're probably looking at probably the early part of November, most likely. So uh, hopefully he makes a full recovery, gets back to play, and I would suspect that they'll send uh, back and back to the uh, junior ranks once he's ready to, to play and all healed up from that injury. A bunch of updates today on some PTOs. One that's been rumored but reportedly not true, at least not as of yet, but there was some speculation which came from Bob Stoffer, uh, who covers the Edmonton Oilers, saying that former Oiler and former Bruin Milan Lucic uh, was getting a PTO with the New Jersey Devils. But that has been, um, I guess by some reporters, proven to be not the case. Uh, of course, confirmation as well that Lucic needs to be granted uh, you know, permission by the NHL and Gary Bettman to uh, to sign any contract or partake in you know official NHL work, so uh, we haven't heard of that being the case. So yeah, that PTO for right now is uh, not official. I'm not sure if maybe there is some talks about him getting one there. 
Uh, I know there was word back earlier this offseason that he definitely wants to play if he can find himself a, a contract or get himself a spot. Um, so I suspect they're definitely working on that. But uh, confirmation of him going to New Jersey sounds a little bit premature on that front. But the Devils today did announce PTOs for a couple of other players, uh, including goaltender Michael Hutchison. Uh, of course, right now we know that the the Devils have uh, you know Markstrom and Allen, who most likely will make up your NHL tandem. And then, of course, you still have Nico Dawes as well. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, beyond that. I don't know they, they traded off, off uh, Akira Schmid um, this offseason. And, of course, uh, Kakinen wasn't retained. So I, I don't know if they'd have need for Hutchinson at the AHL level or um, uh, or if he's really just doesn't stand a great chance to get the, a gig. I'm not really sure. But he could provide some depth. I mean, he's got a little bit of NHL experience and has been around the game uh, long enough now that he could be a, a decent number three for some teams if you want to – not have to worry about your prospect goalies, um, you know, having to call them up. We'll see. Also, defenseman Jacob Sporo, formerly the Boston Bruins, also was heading to camp with the New Jersey Devils on a PTO. Um, we've also got some interesting PTOs in Ottawa. Uh, the Ottawa Senators today announced PTOs for two players. So yesterday I talked about the Sens because they had a, uh, an event with uh, the media and uh, several uh, influencers and fans, etc. And Steve Steos did say that they were exploring um, and investigating uh, a few veteran PTOs they might be bringing in. And they announced them tonight. So I'm not sure if there's going to be any more. I'd suspect probably not, but you never know. Um, one of them has really caught everybody off guard. But one's Kalen Addison, uh, the young right shot defenseman, formerly of the San Jose Sharks. Prior to that, of course, he was with Minnesota, originally drafted by Pittsburgh. Uh, of course, had a really good start to his young career, then kind of really tapered off. Uh, but he's right shot, um, you know, has some good. Puck moving skills, um, we'll see. I mean, I'm a little surprised uh, that not, not so much that they would bring him in, but I thought if they did bring in a defenseman on a PTO, it might be a left side D, not a right side D. They actually have quite a few right side D now. It used to be an area of weakness, but with the moves in the offseason, uh, they don't. I mean, they got Zub and Jensen will be your top two. Uh, you got Jacob Bernard Docker uh, is likely going to be your number three. You get Travis Hamannick there, still a year left. Uh, he's probably going to be the seventh defenseman. He has a no move clause, so they can't even waive him. Um, so I would suspect that you know those are going to be your four guys. And you have Max Gannett, who's uh, like a 23 year old, I think he is. He right shot prospect. He's been pushing for some NHL games too. Who's actually, you know, I think he's got a, a bit of a future there. So uh, a little surprised to bring in somebody else. But if nothing else, this might just push a guy like Bernard Docker to to really make sure he ups his game. Um, but on the left side. After Sanderson and Shabbat, who will eat up a lot of minutes, and then Tyler Clevin's likely going to be that third pair defenseman on the left side, but there's not really much depth for call ups. Uh, so, in all, that's probably the team's weakest depth spot on the whole roster. Uh, if they run into any injuries on the left side of their blue line, uh, somebody's going to have to play their weak side or something because they just don't have the, the depth there. So, we'll see um, what the Sens do. Now, the other. PTO has got a lot of people raising their eyebrows going, what is Nikolai Kuhlman? Uh, Nikolai Kuhlman has not played in the NHL uh, in geez, six to seven years. I think it was 2018, if I'm not mistaken. He's playing in the KHL for five, six years. Um, of course, he played a decent amount in the NHL previously um, between uh, the Maple Leafs and the Islanders. Now, a couple of the Senators brass would be quite familiar with Kuhlman. Steve Steos and senior VP Dave Poulin both worked for the Leafs, uh, and they worked for the Leafs while Kuhlman would have played there. So they definitely know this guy. And the other connection here, too, is apparently, uh, even though he's Russian-born and played in Russia and spent a lot of time over in where he's originally from, uh, Kuhlman apparently has been uh, in Ontario training uh, with Matt Nickel. Of course, Matt Nickel also works for the Senators. He, he was hired to do a lot of their training and stuff as well. So certainly uh, lots of connections to this player. So maybe they're throwing him a freebie here, but he's 37 going on 38 years old. Um, and not like he's been lighting it up in the KHL either. Based on the roster, I just don't really see where he fits. Um, I know they want experience. I know they want veterans. I know they want leaders. That's all good. And Travis Green is... Uh, expected to be running a really hard training camp. Um, I would be really curious to see how this works out. I I, I have my doubts it's going to lead to a contract, but 
you know, uh, we'll we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. I, I did not see that one coming at all. I thought if they brought in another, you know, forward for a PTO, you know, maybe like a guy like a James Van Riemsdyk or a Mike Hoffman. Not that even those guys really make a total a lot of sense for them, but at least they have a very recent NHL experience and, and they're not quite as old. So, anyways, interesting nonetheless. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, interesting news out of Ottawa. Uh, we do have some other news in the Toronto Maple Leafs organization. They've signed a defenseman Marshall Refi. Uh, he gets a two-year deal, and the interesting part about it is it's actually a one-way contract. Now this contract, I believe, doesn't kick in until next year because it's an extension, but it's two years at league minimum, uh, and it's a one-way deal. And it's believed that the main reason they give him a one-way deal, one, they obviously believe that he can play NHL games. If they didn't, they wouldn't. They would make that kind of signing, because uh, if he didn't, they did, if they didn't think he could play NHL games, they wouldn't be obviously really keen and interested in retaining him. And this will make him a lot less likely to be claimed on waivers, because during that two-year period, at this point at least, it's difficult to imagine him being a full-time NHLer. Things can change over a year or two, of course. Uh, we'll see. And obviously, the better he plays, and the more chance he'll get, he'll that'll keep leading to more and more, and eventually could lead to a full-time spot down the road. But for right now, um, if they do have to send them down, they'd be more comfortable putting them on waivers because he'd be less likely to get claimed because he's going to be a lot more expensive since he doesn't have that two-way component to the contract. So that's another signing there out of uh, Toronto. Uh, former Ottawa Senator, Detroit Red Wing, and Chicago Blackhawk, Dominic Kubelik, uh, of course, who was horrible in Ottawa. He did not do very well. Uh, had a few good goals during his you know, limited run there. Of course, he was one of the the main roster players that came over in the Alex DeBrinket deal when he was traded to Detroit. But generally speaking, Kubelik wasn't a great fit there, and you could tell towards the second half of the year that they had no interest in bringing him back. I'm surprised that he wasn't moved to the deadline, but it's not from lack of trying. It was mostly because there was no interest. Um, former 30-goal guy went downhill quick, and he's ended up signing over in the Swiss League. Uh, so his run in the NHL, has come to a close. Uh, I don't expect him to be back. You never know. I uh, didn't expect Nikolai Kuhlman back either, but hey, uh, here we are. So you just never know. Some RFA updates for you as well. Uh, some updates from Dave Pagnona of the fourth period.com on a few different scenarios. Cole Perfetti in the Winnipeg Jets uh, still appears to be a major gap, according to Pagnota. Um, Perfetti is very much open to signing long term. If the Jets would make him a, you know, offer that's lucrative enough to make him want to sign it, I guess. But there's major gaps between the two sides on a long term deal. The general feeling that he gets talking to people is that they are likely going to end up settling on a shorter term bridge deal because the fact that I think they can't come to terms on a long term deal is just proven to be quite challenging you never know but things are pointing to a bridge deal in that sense being more likely right now uh, in detroit uh, there is optimism you could say and it sounds like some traction has been gained would be the choice of words that pegdona used when talking about lucas raymond and also references the fact that uh, their top young defenseman mo sider also could be kind of lumped into that same kind of category. Raymond and Sider are actually training together in Germany. So uh, they're kind of kind of going through this together, if you will, trying to get long-term deals done um, with, uh, with the Red Wings. And we know the Iserman can be a, a tough nut to crack when it comes to his negotiations. And uh, there's been different you know uh, feelings out there about what's going down and what's happening that maybe uh, Iserman might be pushing more of like, shorter deals. Um, but... It sounds like there is optimism, at least right now, and some traction gained on getting a long-term deal done. So right now, I guess you would say that both sides are hopeful that they'll both be in camp and won't miss any time. Time is ticking, though, but like we said before, um, you know, until there's a pressure point, it's it's kind of difficult to say. And with Jeremy Swayman, now I've seen Elliot Friedman when appeared on the NHL Network and was talking about it, and essentially he kind of said that same sort of thing, was that there's no pressure point right now. Um, but he had heard that he had heard – similar stuff to the reports that came from Ryan Whitney on Spit and Chicklets, but essentially what Whitney said, uh, he had heard, because there was the, the rumors about $10 million that Swayman wanted, and what Whitney said was that it was more likely like the McAvoy contract, and Elliot Freeman said he's heard the same thing, so about nine five. Um, we've heard Swayman's comments as well about not only, you know, getting what he thinks is a fair deal, but kind of setting the market and, you know, doing the right thing for, 
you know, the other goalies in the league and that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, if you get one guy and takes a deal that's out of whack, it kind of throws the market off for everybody else. And it doesn't sound like he really wants to do that. He's sticking to his guns and he wants to be paid appropriately. He's been one of the top, you know, young goalies in the NHL. Um, and I guess the Bruins continually want him to prove himself. I can understand to a little bit on the Bruins side, the fact that he he's done really well, but he hasn't been the guy on his own. And, you know, without Olmark there to carry the bigger chunk of the workload, is that going to impact his performance? I, I do see why they'd be mildly concerned. But at this point, you traded Olmark. You kind of set yourself up. You know, looking at what they've done with free agency, they spent some money on Sidorov and Lindholm and all these other guys. Like, you know, you should have maybe looking after your your top young stud goaltender. Uh, to me, it was I'm surprised it's not a bigger priority. Uh, you know, according to Friedman, he doesn't. He, he said nobody's really panicking just yet, and nobody, nor should they. But listen to some other fans. There are people that are kind of ticked and think that this should have been looked after long time ago. But the other thing too that Whitney had said was that. There had been no discussions in about three weeks that they're not getting back to him, that Swayman and his, and his camp uh, have been having a difficult time hearing back from the Bruins. Well, I know one of the Bruins uh, reporters, Joe Haggerty, made an interesting comment today saying that Swayman's been working out in Boston. He is skating with the like the captain skates that they do before training camp uh, at Warrior Arena in Boston. So he says he would see Bruins' leadership all the time. So there's no reason why there wouldn't be any communication. It's not like he's waiting for a phone call when he probably sees him in person on a daily basis. So it's difficult to say where things are at. Um, But, you know, at this point, uh, it sounds like Swayman is sticking to what he wants. He wants a similar deal to the McAvoy contract. They also reference the fact that, you know, McAvoy and Pasternak and these young guys kind of pushed the Bruins brass to kind of, you know, pay up a little bit more than maybe what they wanted, but they, they, not that these contracts aren't fair. They're based on market value. They're still, they're very fair. But in the past, we did see a philosophy within the Bruins, like, you know, with Bergeron and Chera and Marchand and all the, the older Bruins that have come before them, that they all kind of took less. And it's not that these guys aren't willing to take a little less, but they want to be appropriately paid and earn their money too, right? It's not like they're, you know, not having a team first philosophy. It's just, it can only give so much back, right? So it's hard to say. Either way, some definitely refutes there from Haggerty. Some, you know, uh, you know, similar comments from Friedman than what what Whitney had said yesterday. So it kind of lines up that there's definitely a big gap there, for sure. And it sounds like Swayman really wants a long term deal after what he went through last year in arbitration, and it just could get really complicated. So we'll see. Hopefully they get something worked out. And a couple of notes on Toronto. One, uh, a lot of podcasts are starting to come back now and getting a lot more information. I know 32 Thoughts will be back tomorrow. Uh, of course, Jeff Merrick's not with Sportsnet anymore. We did learn that uh, Elliot Freeman's new co-host for the 32 Thoughts podcast is Sportsnet's Kyle Bukoskis. Uh Kyle, I think, will be tremendous uh, replacement for Jeff. Uh, it's going to be weird. I mean, Merrick was worked with Freeman for so long that it's going to be weird having a different voice there. But, uh, but Kyle's a bright young hockey. Um, journalist so to me I think he's he's a great choice there so I'll be curious to see what uh, Elliot's first uh, season um, pod has to say tomorrow but I know today Chris Johnson's first uh, episode of his new season come out today and he talked a lot about the Leafs uh, of course which he covers Toronto and plugged in there more than most other franchises uh, Nick Robertson still has no desire to be a Leaf he's back uh, working out and I also heard Pierre Lebrun make some comments as well uh, on Robertson today too so they're both kind of saying the same thing that there's still no desire to be a Leaf uh, there's still um, in fact he's he's waiting once it's resolved as in a move uh, even though a lot of people say that he should kind of give it up and just sign because there's an opportunity for him to find a home uh, on that left side the, the left wing uh, position is not as deep as it once was and there's a prime chance for him to come in and grab a spot and make the most of it um, but it sounds like there's still absolutely no change there that he wants to be traded so I mean, you know we've heard rumblings from the Leafs about bringing in some other players at PTO we know we, Max Pacioretty was a name that's been out there as well so like you know it's not um, not surprising that they're looking at other options because it doesn't sound like they have any um, confirmation or you know anywhere any anything to say that he's going to show up for camp because uh, they you know when when like Pierre LeBron and I was point blank asked about is he going to show up what's he going to do and the word was like we don't really know 
uh, how far is he going to push it? I mean, a lot of people think he should give it up and go, but we'll see. Nick Robertson, absolutely no desire to sign, no desire, nothing has changed. Uh, he's still back home training, which would for him would be, would be in California, and we'll see. But, uh, you know, we've talked about a variety of different places we, he could end up. You know, I looked over an article the other day saying he should – Maybe uh, Edmonton would be a good landing spot. We've heard about Dallas being a good landing spot. Maybe he could join his brother. Of course, being a California kid, could one of the California teams pick him up, um, You know, which is going to be challenging too. I think L.A., there's an opportunity there for sure, but hard to say. Now, the other note on the Leafs as well, Yanni Hockenpah, Chris Johnson says he's more optimistic now than uh, he has been recently to say that maybe that situation could still work out and maybe Hockenpah still might be a Leaf, could be at camp. Uh, maybe he has to go to camp on a PTO instead of a contract so they can evaluate where things are at. Hard to say, but there's still some hope and some optimism there from CJ that Hawk and Paw and the Leafs might work something out. Uh, uh, some other updates, too. When it comes to the dry saddle extension, there was an article in the Toronto uh, Sun talking about will that affect Mitch Marner? And, you know, when what we don't know what Marner's future holds right now. Uh, lots of discussion around Marner's future in Toronto. Is it going to be there? Is it going to be somewhere else? And essentially, this article kind of summarized what I would think to be fair is that it's. I think it's really going to depend on how this year goes. I don't think they're going to rush into anything. They're going to see how he responds to new coach Craig Berube. They're going to see how the season goes. The big thing, too, for the Leafs is the playoffs. At the end of the day, they have to learn to score and win in the playoffs. And if they can't do that, then they need more change. Uh, you know, like Austin and uh, Willie are signed long term. Tavares and Marner are not. So obviously they have all the question marks around their future. And at the end of the day, this uh, Leon Drysaddle extension of $14 million. Uh, it was a Steve Simmons article, and I don't normally care for too much for what Steve Simmons has to say. But I do think that this article, he actually made some sense for once and says that he doesn't think that the Drysaddle contract is really going to affect Marner. And I will add a little anecdote here that I think it'll affect Marner if he leaves. I don't think he will if it will affect him nearly as much contract wise, if he stays, if he stays in Toronto and if they decide that they want to work out an, an extension before he hits free agency, July one next summer, then I think Marner's comparables that he's going to want to focus more on are going to be Austin and Willie, uh, which is what the way it's always been. They have like a pecking order there. And all honesty, I don't think the Leafs are going to be interested at all in paying him as much or more than Matthews. That just doesn't make any sense with Matthews locked in at 13 and a quarter million for the next was a four years um you know i don't see uh, a scenario where they pay him more than that so does he get to maybe 12 12 five maybe at most that's probably the max um you know if if he does end up walking as a free agent next summer i can absolutely see him using the dry saddle contract as a comparable because it's going to drive his price up i think it's you know like he doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the leafs are not going to want to pay more than matthews and he knows that he's not more valuable to Toronto than Matthews. So, like I said, as long as he's a Leaf, his comparables are there internally. Uh, externally, if he tries to leave, though, then he's going to be looking for some big bucks. And at this point, with Drysaddle signing, you can make an argument that with all the pending UFAs, you know, if without, you know, with all the possible free agents, if things don't change, Marner would probably be, be the biggest name on the free agent market next year. Uh, so you know that teams get crazy in free agency, and somebody's going to overpay and try to lure him out of Toronto, and it could happen. Uh, same thing goes for John Tavares. Does he have a future? You know, the, the article I was looking at for Tavares actually was from a few weeks ago, um, but it just kind of made a, some points, you know, kind of indicating that the author of the article felt that Tavares probably isn't coming back. Um, you know, if you take a look at the fact of how his role could change, and a lot of this will be probably determined as the year goes on here as well, because there's a lot of speculation on how the Leafs plan to use JT this year. And if he's already he's already lost to C, uh, if he gets a reduced role, reduced ice time, um, you know, I think they they may try to slowly try to phase out here. Is kind of what the, the word is. They know if you look at some other older centers that you know whether it be like o'reilly kopitar like some of these guys as they you know get a little older and did like a you know two three years shorter deal than their contract after having a longer term deal um you know they had they've significantly less money um you know is john Tavares going to want to stay in toronto for like four million dollars because i don't see them offering a whole lot more than that 
for him to stay. And like I said, after the changing of the guard and giving up the captaincy and all that, I, I, I think a scenario exists where he could. I don't think it's absolutely given that he leaves. I just know this or the article I was referencing. Um, they felt that he would be done this year. And, you know, the Leafs could end up with a whole, you know, lots of flexibility next offseason. If, if Marner and Tavares didn't come back, that would free up a ton of money. Like they wouldn't have the core. The core four would be no more. I know. I know. I've had some heated debates with some people on on uh, Twitter about the core four versus like the, the new core four in Edmonton is what they're calling it. And like you know, obviously the thing with Toronto's core four is two of them are expiring soon and could very much change. And you know, um, it, it could it could drastically change the uh, the setup of their team and how they're built. And that could be a big opportunity to to maybe make some significant change. So we'll see. At this point, I would say that there's a good possibility that Marner and Tavares is their last year. But if things go well, then I don't know. I wouldn't be shocked at all if both of them are back. But this is definitely a make-or-break season, I think, at least for them and their future with the franchise. But let me know what you think. Uh, is Robertson going to sit out of training camp if he's not traded? Let me know how long you think he's going to take that and how far he's going to push that to get what he wants. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Hello.